The original alternative media conference at Goddard took place from June 17th through June 20th of 1970, less than a year after Woodstock and a month and a half after the shootings at Kent State. The period was one of political turmoil, as well as the heyday of alternative media or the counterculture or the hippies, depending on your perspective. I had been working in freeform radio since its very beginnings in 1963, first with Bob Fass at Radio Unnameable at WBAI in New York, later at KMPX and KSAN in San Francisco, the first commercial freeform stations. After that, I helped introduce the freeform format at WFMU in New Jersey and CKGM FM, later Shom FM in Montreal. I graduated from Goddard in 1967 and received a Master of Arts in Teaching from Antioch's Putney Graduate School in 1969. In January of 1970, I approached Jerry Witherspoon, the president of Goddard, with the idea of an alternative media course that would do more than deal with the subject in an academic context. Students would pursue a real world project. I pursue, uh, proposed two possibilities. One was an FM radio station for Goddard. The other was an alternative media conference. Jerry was enthusiastic and we agreed that I teach the class the next semester, beginning in March. I proposed the two ideas to the class of about 15 students and asked them to vote for either the media conference or the radio station as the semester project, and the media conference won. It was the work of the students in that course that made the alternative media conference possible. Every major decision was made with class consensus and Goddard approval. The college agreed to make the school available for the conference in late June after the semester had ended. We promised Goddard that we would take precautions to prevent the conference from degenerating into an out of control pop festival. We would not publicize the event in the media. We would send out specific invitations to key movers and shakers in radio, video, and film, alternative newspapers, underground comics, and the movement, the areas where the alternative culture was emerging. We asked each invitee to tell no one about the event. If they wanted someone else to be there, we asked them to tell us and we would invite them. Amazingly, this crazy idea worked. The conference was a shared secret until the event took place. A large percentage of those invited chose to attend. Mike Bradford and two other students volunteered to go to the West Coast to visit appropriate media figures and urge them to come. Goddard agreed to return their room and board to finance the trip. Mike, now the producer of Alberta, Canada's Central Music Festival, remembers the three traveling from Plainfield to the West Coast in a VW Beetle and promoting the alternative media conference to every radio station, record company, and alternative press and media outlet they could find from Vancouver to San Diego. They even spent an afternoon with Ken Kesey shoveling compost on his garden, met with Ben Funk Torres at Rolling Stone when it was still a 25 cent tabloid, and with radio pioneer Big Daddy Tom Donahue mm -hmm. and a host of others. As word got out about the conference, several prominent media people came to Goddard to help in the planning, including Augie Bloom, then National Promotion Director for RCA Records, Danny Goldberg, then a columnist for Billboard magazine, Mario Medias, known as the Big M, then Promotions Director then FM Promotions Director for Atlantic Records, 
and Jeff Sterling, then owner of several Canadian radio stations. RCA and Sterling donated money to help cover the cost of the event. Mario, representing Atlantic, gave us three choices. $6,000 or Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, or $3,000 along with shows by several up-and-coming Atlantic artists. We went for the $3,000 donation from Atlantic plus assorted artists who turned out to be the rock band Cactus, the Jay Giles Band, and Dr. John. The Hog Farm approached us and offered to run a campsite. Its illustrious founder, Wavy Gravy, was having a back operation and couldn't attend, but the rest of the crew were all there. We gave them the Clay Hill area for the campsite where they prepared and served food around the clock and maintained numerous tents. Those attendees who chose not to camp out with the farmers were offered the options of staying in a dorm or in a nearby hotel. By the start of the conference, all the hotels in the area and all the dorms on both campuses uh, were filled, and there were several hundred people camping out and partying with the hog farm. In addition to the meals provided by the hog farm, all those attending the conference were offered meals at no additional charge at the two Goddard cafeterias. Goddard chartered a plane from San Francisco with the understanding that all of the people on board would be charged to completely cover the cost. A Berkeley student who'd been vouched for by a Goddard faculty member was responsible for collecting the fares. Unfortunately, he told everyone that the flight was free and refused to accept any money. Goddard ended up paying for the flight. The keynote speech was given out of doors in front of the old library by spiritual teacher Baba Ram Das, the author of the best-selling classic Be Here Now. Ram Das also led a workshop on stress reduction and conflict resolution, and his guiding mantra and meditation helped to bring the many different, often clashing progressive agendas into greater harmony. Peter Wolf of the Jay Giles Band described the event as an elite Woodstock. There is no accurate account of how many people attended the conference, but it's been widely estimated that about 1,700 were there. Many of the key players in the early days of non-commercial radio were there, as well as most of the pioneers of commercial FM rock radio. Add to that editors and writers of most of the country's underground newspapers, early independent filmmakers and video collectives, numerous record company executives, and political radicals of all kinds. The weather for the length of the conference was idyllic, mostly in the 70s. From the time attendees began arriving, the pond on what was then the Northwood campus was transformed into a nude swimming hole. As amazing as it may seem today, most of the people in attendance from either coast were not bi-coastal, and many had never been across the country. I remember how many West Coast people were startled by the firefly, something they had never seen before. Also, there were the, uh, the creator and first editor of Mad Magazine, Harvey Kurtzman, Paul Krasner, editor-publisher of The Realist, Erwin Silber, editor of the folk music magazine Sing Out, and underground cartoonists Gilbert Shelton and Art Spiegelman. Two comics were printed on the Goddard mimeograph and distributed at the conference. One was Alternative Media Conference and Stories, featuring the fabulous Furry Freak Brothers starting a pirate radio station. The other was Saturday Mindfucky Funnies, a collaboration of Kurtzman, Shelton, and Spiegelman. 60s radical Jerry Rubin alleged that someone had stolen $500 from his girlfriend's wallet and demanded that the conference reimburse him. We settled on $250. In 
Several years later, uh, Rubin apologized to me, explaining that the Chicago 7 trial, where he was one of the defendants, had made him crazy. But everyone had been acquitted the previous January, uh, February. The one notorious event, one notorious event happened at the very end of the conference at a comic book seminar in the basement of the new library featuring a panel including Kurtzman, Shelton, and Spiegelman. Quoting Danny Goldberg from his book, Bumping Into Geniuses, just as Kurtzman was beginning to describe his take on the Woodstock culture his work helped to spawn, a couple disrobed and started having sex on the floor. Several attendees started clapping their hands in rhythm with the couple's movements. In response, two feminists angrily yelled at the lecherous attendees to stop clapping. Kurtzman and the other panelists looked perplexed, and the crowd that had come to hear them quickly dispersed." Unquote. Despite that one notorious event, the overall reaction to the conference seemed positive. There were dozens of reviews, most of them positive. The only negative article that I know of was by Al Aronowitz, writing in his daily column in the New York Post. Aronowitz is best remembered as the friend of Bob Dylan's who turned the Beatles onto marijuana. I was a resident student at Goddard a few years earlier when Aronowitz, then an unknown writer, had shown up at the college without notifying the school asking questions of the students for what he said was an article he was writing for Playboy. The word around the campus was this guy was a narc, to use the terminology of the time. I informed the college's publicity director, who confirmed with Playboy that Aronowitz wrote, was writing an article for them. Goddard, annoyed that Aronowitz had not notified them, asked him to leave, which he did, and the article was never written. I've always felt that Aronowitz viewed his alternative media conference column for the Post as payback. Rolling Stone's three-page article, The Media Freaks Meet the Movement, was written by a San Francisco writer named Mike Godwin using the nom de plume of Black Shadow. Toward the end of the article, which was mostly positive, Godwin had these comments. The conference was a fairly representative cross-section of the, quote, community. And that cross-section was able to operate with a framework of total freedom. Since everybody could do whatever they wanted, there were no cop-outs available. Very, very few tried to join with all their brothers and sisters to talk about living in the USA in 1970. Was anyone from the Radical Caucus aware that four people were dead in Kent, Ohio? With few exceptions, the delegates to the alternative media conference danced the hippie dance on a slack wire suspended over a sea of National Guardsmen and dead Cambodian children. It was a pretty dance, and I think everybody had a good time in Vermont. And after all, it was free. No, it wasn't. Nothing is ever free, boys and girls, unquote. The original alternative media conference brought together many of the top countercultural figures in the music, radio, broadcast news, and television industries, most of whom had never met prior to this event. The conference was crucial in establishing business, creative, and personal connections which continue to grow to this day. The meeting brought together a range of alternative radio figures transforming scattered individual efforts into a freeform radio movement. While it was co-opted later in the 70s into progressive rock, then album-oriented rock, then classic rock, the spark that freeform ignited helped redefine non-commercial radio and much of today's web-based audio streaming. The Video Freaks Collective, born the previous summer at, the, at Woodstock, 
brought the emerging indie video community to the alternative media conference. Its influence can be felt in much of the independent film and video in the decades that followed. At night during the original conference, the Freaks rear screen projected videos made at the conference and from their archive from a, inside a giant inflatable called the Blue Calzone to an audience of several hundred alternative video buffs sitting on the lawn right outside this building. The participation of the video freaks as well as numerous freelance video and filmmakers from around the country stoked a movement that profoundly influenced the growth and prominence of indie video and social media in the modern age. Danny Goldberg, in his book, Bumping Into Geniuses, wrote that I, quote, had organized the conference with a utopian notion of creating connectivity among underground radio people, rock writers, musicians, political radicals, and hippie visionaries. A few years later, it would be impossible to explain to those who weren't there what the connection was between the yippies, mysticism, and the crass commercial task of getting rock records on radio, or from stations' point of view, selling advertising. But in the moment, it all seemed to make sense." Unquote. I believe our present and popular culture is in many respects the results of a fusion between the 70s dominant culture and the counterculture of the time. The innovations and ideas that stemmed from the conference have in turn created changes that many participants believe extend beyond even the impact of Woodstock. Over the years, I've probably heard the statement the Alternative Media Conference changed my life from several hundred media people.